sounds like and for speaking as well. And so somebody who can speak to these issues from lots and so we very kindly agreed to, to join in. I'm gonna kick off and then turn it over to him to uh, uh, to give you the real goods from literally and figuratively the front line. So um, <clears throat> so this climate gains is three topics. One that may seem on the face of it uh, quite different than what we've talked about before when we're talking about food and water and agriculture and health and even entrepreneurship tool, but it's one that hopefully I can figure out how to advance the slides on and tell you a story. Maybe, or maybe not. Maybe it'll be extemporaneous. There we go. Um, a one that starts actually uh, when I was the age of all the undergrads in Cara, and, you know, um, and uh, with a big event that ended the Cold War, followed the Berlin Wall, ended the Cold War, and that in the security realm, decades long East West US Soviet competition in the Cold War was lifted. And then it wasn't that there were new issues that we could pay attention to but issues that we had space to suddenly pay more attention to. And so in that realm, environment, health, development, poverty became part of security discussions in ways that really kind of questioned, okay, what is it? How do we define security? What is it we're trying to secure? Is it just about the use of force or do we need to go kind of above and below the level of the nation state to understand what these issues are? And so this turned out with what I started with studying and then working in the practice world, so kind of how I came to it. My question today is given all these really big changes, the rate of change in the environmental realm, uh, no, unfortunately, the ongoing conflicts, but some big opportunities for investments, big progress. This is progress on the world. Um, Countries coming together and say they're going to set aside 30% of total marine and land area by 2030 under some sort of conservation. So, huge ambitious changes. Is this another moment of inflection that allows us to talk about um, these issues where climate change and environmental issues are brought into a security context? Lots of different ways. It turns out that folks are linking these. So, it really kind of depends on where you sit and who you're talking to. What's gotten historically the most attention is what is the scarcity or in some cases the abundance of certain resources meant for contributing to that. And so not actually that different the notion of security, still very much in questions of war and peace, broader stability and fragility, even if it's not kind of overt violent conflict, but it's still some sense that this is not just the Enviro 300 down the hall, who are the environment folks, this is high politics of issues of, um, of, of, of peace and security. Certainly lots of questions, and boy, is it in the headlines now with the war in Ukraine, um, and in Gaza. It should be more in the headlines, but we know what's in Sudan, you know, these ongoing conflicts where the environment is also one of the casualties um, that's going on. The impact of uh, environmental impact of security institutions in the United States. That's a lot of platforms, right? Trucks, uh, buildings, airplanes, all these kinds of stuff. Big carbon footprint. But this other opportunity with human security in the 90s and then continues today to ask more fundamental questions about what is it that is really killing people and what is it that we can have a more inclusive notion of security. So um, that we can bring these environmental and health and development issues in ecosystem security. If we go across the street here and talk to our folks in ecology and biology, they are going to actually talk about it. We use some of the same terms, but really important to understand they're actually worried about the security of the ecosystem, but not the humans, right? The humans are part of the problem. Um, so, again, uh, different ways that these issues are brought together. Environmental peace building, maybe. We'll talk so much about that today, but in part, kind of a notion of turning that those questions about conflict on the head and saying, hey, listen, whether it's a river or a lake or a shared forest, we have these interdependencies that ignore political boundaries. 
but we're we're reliant on these resources in ways. Can't we find ways to yeah. proactively collaborate on them uh, so that we build trust between communities? And finally, climate change. You know, so kind of I say final. It's like, well, that's why this is what we're talking about. Why is it last? Last in part because it's really only 2007 that this becomes a discussion. So there is a big call to attention to environment security after the Cold War. There was another 15 or 16 years um, before climate became a big part of it. And I have a slide that enumerates some of those reasons, but the short version is it initially was just seen as A, a future issue, not a today issue. But if it was the case, certainly isn't the case now. That it was so long term incremental pursuit that it just didn't kind of work in a conversation that was focused on, say, given conflict and understanding how competition for resources and scarce resources would play into. And so some of this is really familiar. We talked, you know, Dr. Wang Gui did a fantastic presentation on changes in capitalism and the competition and conflict at times between capitalists and, and sedentary farmers, right? Something that's gone on for a very long time. Part of where it comes into this discussion is the rate of change and how, in some ways, these kinds of conflicts can become more deadly and more intense. And so, here too is like the genocide in, in Darfur. It required a conflict on the Syrian cartoon that decided that they wanted to arm one side versus another. But in part, it played across these two different groups in a country that has dramatic desertification and at the same time rising livestock and competition. So the herders were coming and, and eating before the department president. So this is, was not the reason that that will happen, but you can't tell the story and really understand the larger context. Uh, as Matt has been coming to a number of these in his home country of Pakistan, it, uh, it is if you want to get the attention of traditional security actors in the United States, there are lots of reasons why they would care about the stability of Pakistan, right? And they and it's a challenging portfolio of the Secretary of State, fought these multiple wars with India, it has internal um, uh, competition and control, some question about whether the military is civilian run. But the flooding, this is the 2010 one, there was another in 2012. These are areas of the country that are, oh, it's covering up the caption, but uh, partially are completely submerged. And so in those areas, they are losing the year crop. They are losing their livestock, right? They're starting over. And so it is not that this creates an India-Pakistan war. If you want to understand fundamental Stability and security of Pakistan state, you have to understand that this is now becoming more frequent in terms of this massive, almost peaking level set of perturbations that suddenly the security folks, okay, you have my attention to this and underlying threat that I have to factor in to understand the future stability of this important region. Other dimensions that aren't so much that kind of high politics of peace and security yet are critically. Um, important. We essentially have a new ocean with the thinning of the Arctic Sea. Right? It's disappearing. And what does that mean for transportation routes? And particularly, what's that mean for Russian fossil fuels to go to Asia? In, um, in a context where the institutions that we're negotiating that, like the Arctic Council, suddenly Russia is threatening to pull out and we've got that kind of east west in some ways coming back. Um, and so Again, getting attention, I have the Deepwater Horizon one there. One of the prospects is trying to extract resources in this very hostile environment. And if you are any of the literal states, you have lots of concerns for how you would possibly address. It was hard enough and took you know weeks and weeks and weeks to deal with it when it was in warm, relatively calm one. Makes it very cold and in the Arctic. It's a sort of catastrophic concern. Um, to go back to critical to remember that even while that traditional security audience is focusing on one piece of this, so too are the broader UN, in this case, UN development program exhibiting leadership and trying to broaden that discussion and bring it down to the level of uh, 
uh, humans and communities and up above the level of the state to some of the global issues and say, hey, you know, really we need to fundamentally rethink how we define security and therefore what resources are needed to provide it by which actors and institutions. And so really brings issues of health and poverty and livelihood and environmental conditions into a security discussion in ways that hadn't been there before. Um, Dr. Caceres in Honduras, one of the topics that this field has largely missed is um, the targeted assassination of environmental leaders. In this case, pushing back on what is perceived to be positive development on green energy, right? This was an anti hydro dam activist who was murdered in front of her family for that activism. And that's one story. And she was very prominent. She'd already won a Golden Fellows Prize. She was well known in the children to the, the violence. Here's a map uh, of deaths between 2012 and 2021 by country. And so Honduras here, unfortunately, in that period was 117. Um, Philippines is a particularly deadly place to be an environmental activist. Brazil, you know, so this kind of Latin American corridor. Um, th this is one where, by the traditional security realms, the death of one individual is not seen as issues of one piece. Yet, hugely disruptive, and what kind of environmental activism, the participation in democracy, is deterred by the use of force. Right. So, kind of really ranges widely. Um, and this is one that only more recently is getting greater attention, even trying to collect the data, right? Um, so the climate piece. Climate, so a lot of these issues have been part of an environment security discussion, but it really wasn't until 2007, in part because our understanding of the science was that it's not a future issue of today issue. Prominent extreme weather events try to get to garner greater attention that the frequency and intensity of these storms meant the kind of fundamental challenges. So when you have the multiple Hurricane Mitch style events in Honduras, hugely disruptive for the economy, um, for example. And so it kind of, and we had this experience in the US. In some ways it does vary by region. We see the Europeans in some ways kind of getting everybody across the political spectrum on board on climate change for their extreme heat and flooding events, whereas the US and the United States have had to, unfortunately had that galvanizing impact, so it does matter where you sit. Um, the, as I mentioned, the diplomatic and development communities have been focusing on this, joined by the defense community saying, okay, this isn't the, the three hundred major issues that matter on our portfolios as well. UN attention and environmental advocates. In the UN, it's notable to say, as Kara here in Canada, some of the most effective voices within the small island state to push back on those who say, ah, oh, our security, these are two different issues, don't bring them together. And spokespersons and political leadership from small island states say, listen, what could be a more fundamental security threat than the loss of our own territorial integrity from global rise and associated complications with availability of fresh water and such? And so through the General Assembly and the small island states, but also increasingly now the security council. Uh, the Security Council talks a lot about it. The action is challenging, in part because China and Russia have consistently vetoed the resolution, um, calling it not a security issue, but an economic and environmental issue. Nevertheless, a lot of attention, and Demetrius will talk about how the Europeans and their kind of regional EU level, NATO level organizations are doing that. Um, and so, in this sense, there are lots of different ways that are being understood, climate and security, but stressing already fragile states. So it's it's kind of this notion of a threat multiplier, taking the existing challenges, uh, more extreme, uh, faster, additional threats that are proving to be challenging on a range of fronts. Um, the migration is a quite rational and reasonable response to moving in the face of these environmental challenges. Um, often in combination, right? Critical to remember that people move for multiple reasons. Some are pushes, some are pulls. So it's hard to kind of, I, I really, 
I resist the temptation to put any single adjective like climate in front of refugees or migrants, in part because, especially on refugees, that's not a legal status. And so you quickly are not taken as seriously by the humanitarian community. But nevertheless, you look at kind of, and we saw some of this in the food presentation, the predicted decline in agricultural productivity, given what we're seeing, is it, already we have that as a source of pushing of people to move. And so you combine that um, with the where this is going in terms of, you know, kind of that orange is minus 20 to 50 percent of protected change in crop yields between 2010 and 2015. It's a remarkable decline in agricultural productivity for still largely, um, uh, you know, countries that have a, a large percentage of their population is dependent on agriculture. Demetrius can talk again to the European context, but another way that this has popped up, of course, is the war in the war in Ukraine has shown us how, at least beforehand, interdependent it was in terms of natural gas and the geopolitics of that. Europe's made a very quick transition off that source, but it doesn't mean that they're not still consuming fossil fuels, right? So the United States is not a large exporter of natural gas in petroleum mm -hmm. in the world. It's not Saudi, it's not. And so some different dynamics. And then like, we shouldn't forget the kind of climate justice and the, the folks in the streets <clears throat> who in some cases are framing it this way. I think it gets more headlines than actually is necessarily the case, but it's part of the larger discussion. To, to conclude my portion here, a couple of slides about what, you know, if that wasn't more challenging enough of an agenda or a kind of lens to understand some of the actors and institutions that are engaged from the foreign policy and security policy context on security. One of the things that we've kind of done is like, okay, yes, we've spent a lot of time trying to parse out what contribution, the scarcity or abundance of, of resources um, may have in violence. But let's not forget, and Javier reminded us of this on day one, right? There are real winners and losers and costs of quote unquote, doing the right thing by climate, right? Trying to move along, a, to a green energy transition, to move to renewable energy. That is, a, in this case, with the issue that he's focusing on, lots of mine minerals and metals that go into those renewable energy technologies that allow us to move away from fossil fuels. So we started asking the question, what's the conflict potential of proactively trying to mitigate climate and adapt to climate change? And we have to go in kind of with our eyes open because this is a lot of things that are changing, right? More hydropower. We just talked about Sarah's design for her anti dam activism, right? Um, increased biofuels, growing energy. Well, if you're growing energy, you're not growing food, or you're not keeping that forest intact for the ecosystem services that it can provide. Mentioned the 30 by 30. Increased solar. I have a slide to show you where some of that is playing out here close to home. Increased nuke, the nuke, that's kind of ambiguous because of the economics, but certainly lots of concern with our inability to effectively deal with the waste and the, the threat of, of um, uh, disasters. And, you know, kind of the Fukushima disaster made that very clear. Increased batteries, land grabs. You know, if you are a rich country that is water poor, then historically you import food as the way you deal with that, right? Well, when we had some questions about countries stopping rice export or wheat export because of their own problems, right? Think of Ukraine and Russia, but also in 08 when we had a lot of heat waves, then you see a spike of the China, the Kuwait, the Saudi buying and leasing land in third countries where somebody in the capital can you know, be for example, benefit but the folks who work on that land have now been promised to take that to the crops that the country so they can pay more. Uh, you, you see that playing into conflict. Um, so what we've tried to do is, you know, the sunny version is provide a roadmap to navigate that response to climate change. Although this figure on the right, cartoon on the right, was created for COVID, to me, this is actually, um, there are lots of, 
we have lots of mines in the minefield that we can step on as we try to cross into uh, greener energy and um, this kind of transition we need to do. And so going in with our eyes open so that it's not it's a just and a peaceful transition in ways that are, are critically important. I mentioned hydro. I mentioned growing. It's a, that's a photo doesn't quite get it, but that's a, you know, kind of European biofuels there. There's the European EU flag um, that has had the effect of uh, accelerating deforestation of tropical forests, including the habitat for orangutan. Um, and these are folks in Liberia and uh, Silas Siakor, one of the environmental uh, activists and politicians there, makes a really strong case for declining food security for local people because it's cheaper for European investors to buy up land to be biofuels so that they can meet their climate targets by transportation. Not just Liberia, this are that's uh, chipped North Carolina forests uh, on a port in North Carolina that are set for meeting that European target. And so this is also forest products from the US. This was Sir Daniel Bell Morant, one of smart colleagues, this is his thesis. <clears throat> that parks versus people notion is fantastic that we have momentum recognizing biodiversity crisis. And yet there are people who live in these parks you know, protecting that area is not without uh, challenges. The geopolitical, certainly the renewable energy inputs in part because China has so many of those mine minerals and metals. This is a figure that we did for the National Climate Assessment. It's a little busy, but this was what minerals from what parts of the world that the United States imports 30% or more for its renewable energy technology. So solar, wind, batteries. And so you can see from all parts of the world, we're heavily dependent on resources outside. Some cases we have it, but we haven't done it. In part, it tells us that challenges that cover our feet on the ground, right? This is a messy, ecologically, politically, so forth. And so this is what is now the source of the battle. These are Native Americans protesting a copper mine in Arizona because there is increased willingness to do more mining here in the United States that has historically been the case and would again be largely uh, on or near land that is Native American land or federal land that has some sort of protection. So big, big trade offs. And not to leave where we are out of the equation, this is a map of planned and current solar panel deployments. And you say, well, why is that contested? Um, in part because of the politics of the U.S., some of the some of the siting hearings down here. This is near Cincinnati, so we're over here in Athens County. You know, the sun's not quite good enough here. <laughs> it's better farther west and north in the state. But some of the siting hearings have become so contested. You have to go to a medical center to several planning meeting about where you put tents. And some of that's the politics. Some of that's the willingness of some parts of the United States. Um, so it's a sad commentary, yet part of this kind of politicized response is one that is um, in its different manifestations found all over the world. Finally, geoengineering, we can talk about this if you like, but this is these kind of super technical, technological optimistic interventions in the whole, at the kind of uh, global level, uh, cloud seeding and putting iron oxide in the ocean, uh, but lots of concern in ways that fall into this equation. So just and peaceful transition is what we want. This, uh, that photo, but I'll, we'll put, Sarah and I will put copies of this report where we try to encapsulate a lot of it in reports done with the stop and um, but we can make that QR code work for you here shortly. Mm -hmm. um, but it's part of what we, We've done now. I'm talked too long and want to bring in my friend and colleague Demetrius. Demetrius, could you um, jump in with some thoughts on that kind of rapid lay of the land type presentation and uh, share some some insights from the kind of parts of the world and the roles that you've played in this space? Yeah, yeah, of course. Thank you very much, Jeff. Thank you for the invitation um, and. Uh, my contribution here is basically from uh, 
the research that uh, we did the previous five years on the environmental security issues of uh, the European Union. Uh, it has uh, generally it is known about the CSDP, Common Security and Defense Policy of Europe. So um, I could also add some some stuff about uh, some observations that we have done the last two years as the managing director of uh, the refugee camp in Lesbos. The refugee camp in Lesbos is the biggest camp of refugees all over Europe. And um, uh, finally, um, maybe we can make some comments about uh, um, the traditional actors and how they respond. So in order to start, uh, as you saw, um, uh, Dr. Dabelko started with uh, uh, back in 1987 uh, with uh, the Berlin Wall. And uh, it's the era that the environmental security, the environmental dimensions are uh start to discuss uh, in the security community of the United States. However, in Europe, this debate started basically in 2008 after um, after the the when the United Nations Security Council uh, had a Security Council on climate change issues um, one of the, the, the high representative of uh, Europe, uh, Javier Solana, uh, he started uh, to um, uh, discuss about the climate uh, dimensions of the European security. So we, we immediately started and, we, and Europe entered in this dialogue uh, through uh, the climate change issues, not what we call the environmental changes, not all the other issues of the environment. Basically, what, how climate change will affect uh, security. So uh, we started a research before five years uh, with Dr. Dabelko and two other professors in order to see, uh, to answer three basic questions, how these actors, the European actors, answer three questions. Uh, the question in order to understand how, the, how that works, how, which are the environmental security dimensions of Europe. We started to ask about the, the different actors, security for whom, Security from what? Security through which means. And what we found when we went basically to the Brussels-based Brussels-based um, agencies and actors, uh, plus to a lot of MODs, we found that every actor has some very different answers uh, to these questions. So we went, for instance, to uh, one general directorate of climate change, and they told us that, you know, uh, there are no security dimensions and we do not have um, something about that. However, next to this office in the general directorate of environment, uh, there, were, um, there were provisions, there were measures about the security dimensions. Uh, so many different actors responded very differently. So if we could summarize how Europe um, uh, uh, evaluate, assesses today uh, the environmental dimensions for European security, at the strategic level, we have a very big yes. Yes, at the strategic level, there is a great discussion between the European um, actors, the security, the European security actors about at the strategic level that they want to address it. Uh, in the political rhetoric context, yes, we have a discussion about climate change and the European security. In our common security and defense policy uh, directives, laws, um, um, strategies, yes, we have in there climate change as a major uh, and the environmental dimension as a major threat. However, we do not have specific procedures and mechanisms. Uh, I will give you an instance. In the United States, every branch of uh, the, uh, the Army, Navy, and Air Force has a very specific strategy about how to address the climate challenges. In Europe, we do not have such strategies yet about the different branches. We do not have even the, 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 uh, a common uh, climate security strategy as Europe. And of course, every state, some states have a climate security strategy that responds to very different 
um, very different viewpoints. Each state um, uh, opposes the, the climate change in a very different way and climate security in a very different way. So we do not have we do not have all these uh, different. Uh, we do not. We have very different uh, approaches to how to respond to these climate security challenges. Um, from uh, my experiences in the refugee camp and in connection with the environmental security challenges that we face right now in Europe, uh, we have done the last two years some observations. And these observations are uh, good to be referred because uh, you, you may found the connections between how uh, what we are finding in the migration, between migration and the environmental challenges. And to give you uh, some numbers, uh, the last two years, uh, more than 40,000 people have uh, arrived in uh, our camp, in our refugee camp, and they have uh, continued uh, to their journey to, to Europe. Um, more than 40,000. Uh, what we observe is that a lot of people have the majority of the new arrivals have a, an agricultural or a fishery background. Um, we, we understood from the discussions with these people when we are asking, because all of them are asylum seekers, uh, that there is an inability of the state to improve the environmental conditions of their country. And this is something that they admit all the time. We do not have um, a human environment because something bad happened in our, uh, in, uh, in our country. We didn't like that. Um, after that, we expected that the state will improve the environment, but that never happened. Um, so another, uh, if, we, if we could, um, we also have found that there is uh, serious water stress and uh, a lot of agricultural challenges that we observe from uh, uh, a lot of people uh, uh, during the interviews that they are giving to us. Um, there are a lot of cases where the internal displaced persons, um, because of environmental stress or a natural disaster, after one, two, three years that they stay, they are displaced in their own country. After that, they choose uh, to become immigrants. They choose to say, I will not go back. And finally, uh, one, common, uh, one common statement that we have found is that in case that there are better conditions in the future, all of these people are ready to go back. So they say that in case that we could fix uh, some things in our country, uh, and uh, a lot of times this is connected with the environmental conditions, I am ready to go back to my, to my country. And finally, what we, uh, what we are uh, observing also to the security actors, the traditional security actors here in Europe, is that they are sometimes more open to change because they understood all these challenges. Uh, we have done a lot of discussions with uh, people from Army, Navy, and Air Force, and uh, they, are, they are ready uh, to follow uh, and, to, and to adapt to all these new challenges. And sometimes, you know, while Europe is uh, well known for uh, its climate sensitivities the previous years, especially the Brussels-based uh, agencies. Um, uh, right now, we have seen that these agencies cannot synchronize with all these challenges in order to respond um, uh, in the same manner, to respond dynamically. And traditional actors who were uh, in the beginning uh, didn't have the, in, in, their, uh, in their basket of threats uh, uh, climate change, right now they are ready to incorporate it. To give you an example, uh, the European Defense Agency, which is the agency that is synchronizes the, all the actors uh, and the defense industry of uh, Europe, a lot of uh, small and medium enterprises, uh, they have incorporated in their technologies 
and they have made a, a big network of climate security experts. So uh, the we see, we observe that the traditional security actors are ready to respond while all these agencies that the previous year had uh, said, you know, prepared all and made all these uh, policies and strategies uh, about climate change, after that now they cannot find, uh, they, they have difficulties to find uh, their, uh, their way to move forward. Uh, I'm at your disposal for uh, to discuss and uh, Jeff for whatever question or uh, something to follow up. Thank you very much. Yeah, no, thank you very much, Demetrius. I really appreciate the given in European sense. And uh, we finally got it. To... Can, you, can you hear me, Demetrius? Yes, yes. If you're next to the microphone, I hear you. Okay. Yeah. So I may, uh, uh, we're going to open up the questions and I can certainly restate it to make sure that you can hear what you all are, are asking. But um, so, yeah, so we just threw an awful lot at you in a lot of different dimensions. And But welcome any comments, questions, observations that you all might have um, to share for the balance of the time. Yeah, Tim, please. Yeah, so Demetrius, can you go in, in some greater depth about that dynamic and what you're learning with the people who are, who are um, coming to uh, Europe and coming through Lesbos in terms of understanding the mix of the climate change and environmental pushes, as well as the other kind of uh, political and security pushes that these people have, maybe a little bit about where people are coming from that you're seeing in the camp and how that's changed over time and what you anticipate um, to be uh, the future there. Yeah, 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 yeah. So yes. One other, um, one other, just one second. Just one. Yeah, yeah. How we make the reason to Right. Yeah. So how are you how are you making um, the distinctions on the kind of climate change and environment portion of the push versus these other other reasons that people move? Right. How do you how do you disentangle the various causes? Yeah. Yeah, of course. Um, uh, we uh, at the time, you know, just to give you uh, some details about how how is the situation at the time that these people arrive at the time that they arrive. Uh, we have um, uh, an extensive. Uh, we have an extensive procedure in order for these people to to become asylum seekers uh, in Europe. Um, that's mean that we have all the security actors: Europol, Frontex, uh, uh, Greek uh, police, uh, border police, Coast Guard. All these uh, people are um, are engaged in order to 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 start these people to tell us their story, and uh, in order this story to become a file and to go to the lawyers of the asylum agency in order to see if these people will have uh, a positive decision about asylum, and uh, to give you some numbers, uh, uh, people were uh, in case that uh, uh, there is. Uh, an active war, uh, for instance, in countries like Palestine right now. Uh, also, uh, Afghanistan is considered as a war zone, not a safe area. Uh, Yemen and uh, some specific places in Africa. All these uh, people, uh, immediately they have asylum. Uh, but, however, we also have some people who are coming from um, places that are not a war zone, okay? There are stressors, and they say that uh, uh, I am a, an economic immigrant. I want asylum in, because uh, uh, my life, the future for my family is uh, dangerous, and uh, uh, there are very specific issues that they explain. Uh, climate change and the environmental issues is never the primary reason that these people will leave their country. Uh, 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 the natural disasters, even the natural disasters, even uh, 
um, situations where we have huge earthquakes like uh, uh, in Turkey, uh, it will never be the primary reason that these people will leave their country, okay? Uh, it will be what we call a threat multiplier. It will be a stressor. It will be something that will stress more the state mechanism in order to make it difficult to respond to the needs of these people. So these people, uh, the, the number one reason that they left their country is because they feel insecure uh, because of they feel insecure because of terrorist issues, war issues, uh, religious issues, um, uh, stuff like that. They never left their country because uh, uh, there is no uh, there is water stress or there is they, they they will find the solution. Okay, but all these side issues, the environmental issues, will be hidden sometimes. Will not be will be uncovered, like um, and will be a stressor. For instance, we have a lot of Somali people who have uh, stress with their fisheries. Uh, uh, we have a lot of uh, people who had uh, in uh, uh, basically in North Africa and Central Africa where their agricultural um, uh, actions and activities uh, are under strain. Uh, they will try to do something else. They will try to find hope. They will try to do uh, another job in order to live. And, but that will be a stressor. So we have seen, uh, and of course, in case of natural disasters, there are a lot of people who are displaced because of a natural disaster. After that, the state cannot respond in order to help them, to satisfy them, and they choose to become immigrants. So uh, as a primary uh, reason in order to, to flee. Nobody will left his country, the place that he was born, because uh, there are some environmental issues. Uh, we have, uh, we have um, uh, refugees from Nigeria where they describe us that uh, while the environmental situation uh, in many places was very difficult because there were uh, a lot of uh, oil activities, uh, however, they uh, they left their country after uh, some terrorist groups make them to feel insecure. So um, uh, I think that uh, uh, the, the the primary the primary reason is always something that is connected with security. Afterwards, the environmental dimensions uh, is something that is a multiplier. Uh, that will make these people uh, to say bye-bye to their country. And of course, as we said, in case that the situation would be better, all these people are ready to go back. The first generation refugees and immigrants, uh, I always. Uh, this is what we have seen from the field. Uh, of course, um, uh, the majority of people that we have uh, uh, in our camp is uh, from Middle East and North Africa. Um, these are the places that we can uh, talk about. Uh, I hope that uh, I, I, to cover uh, your question, um, yes, yeah, no, these are you. basically the yeah, yeah, no, thank you, Dimitri. Other, other questions. Yeah, I Maybe for you, <laughs> in relation of uh, environmental leaders, um, uh, all the um, activists of them push them to, to be in this environment of security. Like, and for example, in Panama, we don't have this dimension of it, like, um, um, Leader, environmental leader with insecure. But I'm surprised about uh, cases like Iraq or another cases. So I, I don't know if you have the comfort of another leader that can be pushed to, to go away from the country without the environmental mm -hmm. activity. 
Yeah, well, I mean, I think that individual, uh, I think there are certainly folks who are formally recognized as environmental leaders. I would think that the, a lot of those people who were in that global witness list of people who were targeted uh, and, and, and killed for their activism were local people that, that nothing about their job title said, I'm an environmental leader. They're a member of an affected community that are standing up to the interests that are causing the problems, right? And so um, in that sense, often those aren't people who have the resources and social networks that enable moving out of country. Um, <clears throat> and so definitely there are examples of people who have um, have fled, you know, most of the ones that I'm thinking of are, are people who were, uh, you know, even like the Russians are very good at locking up their environmental activists. And some of those people, if they get out, then they leave the country. Um, but I think in many instances, these people stay. And But the challenge is the kind of evolved norm of the lack of rule of law or or in the Philippines, right? We had a president who saw fit to often use force or at least embrace other people using force against so-called political enemies, right? And so it created that culture of the use of violence. And in, in part, some of it too is not that the state I mean, uh, I think Colombia is particularly has a large number of people because of the intersection of um, illegal activities with drugs and people and all sorts of things, but are often <clears throat> with a big, heavy environmental footprint that it then has community pushback. And so it's actually those forces who are perpetrating some of this violence as well. It's not just the sanctioned or informal state violence. Too. So um, I guess we could maybe we count ourselves lucky that your dispute resolution mechanism for rule of law or it, it hasn't become the way that these things are settled. Um, one has the sense that this ha has happened for a very long time. We just haven't counted them or known about them, like they say, in remote areas that don't get coverage. And, you know, um, part of, and so part of the question is, is this actually new or is this going on and we're just really telling it, paying attention, but a really um, important set of questions. And ones that we're grappling with here too, you have, you have some uh, states and even efforts at the federal level, but some states who are really uh, criminalizing political protests, including environmental protests. And so they're not going to the extrajudicial killing, although you know we had we had a kind of justice movement against the building of a police facility in Georgia, and the police just kind of fired indiscriminately and killed them, right? You know, so there's still this kind of lack of control that will be excused, and maybe one individual gets punished. But so it's it's kind of ranges across in different ways, many more countries than one might think. Of. Great in Panama than that way of resolving some of these issues. So, yeah, Oscar. Uh, just add something about something that you said. Uh, first thing that particularly uh, the people that defend the territory and the natural resources, they decide to stay for the last minute. And sometimes when they when they leave, it's just like for an immediate threat, you know, for a month, for a couple of weeks, but they are Going to the US or Europe, you know, and, and sometimes then mm -hmm. coming back to uh, try to, to stop that, that danger. The other is, is one of the problems with the state. The state is the promoter of this extractive project. And so it's like a fiction uh, in the previous consultation that the government has to be impartial because they are the ones promoting internationally to come here, come to the country. And they become an interested part. So, uh, and in the end, they are the ones that wanting these people to come to our business, are wanting this investment to come. And they uh, do a lot of omission, you know, to not protect this person. So, mostly what I live in, in Honduras, Central America, part of Latin America, mostly that the defenders do is that they just ask for these precautionary measures of the of the of the Commission of International uh, 
of which I'm working to my right, you know. And in the end, these measures are means that the state could give them security, safer measures, and most of them, of the environmental needs that are killed, are uh, supposedly benefit of beneficiaries of these measures, and they are still murdered. So that makes it worse for the state because they followed the protocol of human rights. They went to the commission, the American commission. They were granted this benefit. The state did not protect them, even though they were announced because this person had been threatened to their whole uh, activism. And, uh, and the other thing is that most of this assassination happened in the rural areas, where we have weak states that are not usually, but for example, I'm in the city. And there I feel, uh, not from the state, but other things that can happen with security. The media, social media, you certainly have like a more visibility, but in the rural area, it's like no one's land. And you can be murdering in any corner, every turn, sometime when you're alone, so you're a, you have a lot less uh, uh, capacity to protect yourself. And so in the rural area, when a conflict happens, usually the way of solving it is murdering the, the environmental community. And right now in Honduras, we're experiencing something because if a government that we have now that uh, we're part of the government, not our part of the government, and many human rights defenders, but even with this new government, there's a lot of environmental defenders that have been assassinated. So you see that the measures and the strategy are the interest of the of this other industries goes beyond a political policy. You know, more structural, more a way of exploiting the resources. So uh, somehow we put down like, our alert because, also, because we were saying, oh, this is a our government of the people. And, and we have many friends there, ministers in different areas. But it requires more than a friendship, more than a minister, right? A change of system so we can respond to really protect this environmental leaders. And that is not a uh, happening. And the problem is that for some months we were like, uh, many of the defenders were like, oh no, they'll make the job done, you'll feel more secure. So somehow we let the guard down. And still the leaders were assassinated. So now it's reactivating all of that part of the, of the resistance, you know, and, and more protection measures. So it's, it's very uh, a complex. And, and in the end, the only effective thing against this, because governments are usually respond, is the networking or the group that you, that you work with so you can take care of each other, you know, for moving from one place to the next, you know, like, like what we say in Latin America, so let's go and look at that only the people save the people. So that's, that's the only uh, uh, measure that we, that we really have, you know, not just uh, without fully uh, having uh, confidence in the government because they don't always respond. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Demetrius, I don't know how, how how much of that you could you could hear, but uh, Oscar from uh, Honduras laid out very helpful explanation where the in the Honduran and Central American context it is a structural. It's not at one party and another that those threats are done largely in rural areas and we're away from protection of the state, even when the environmental defenders have gone through. The formal processes of uh, human rights protections and from a commission that obligates the government to provide security, still those people are under great threat and are um, are uh, assassinated nevertheless. And so big structural problems in terms of bringing that uh, kind of conflict resolution out of the informal and the use of violence to, to have uh, okay, okay. protection. Right. Yeah, yeah. You know, uh, the the context, especially in the in the, especially in the Middle East. Um, in the Middle East, we can found that uh, um, from the refugees that arrive. Okay, uh, basically, is uh, the, the result uh, is uh, insecurity because of war. Uh, the people are afraid. Uh, not only the Syrians, not only the Afghans, who are the majority of the people who are, are coming, 
the people are afraid from um, uh, that uh, the following years and months there will be a bigger war that will be expanded and uh, this is the major concern. Uh, however, the Africans have uh, economic challenges, basically. Uh, the problem there is basically um, economic challenges plus the terrorist groups, small groups, not well organized, small groups that are uh, uh, creating serious tensions and problems to these people. Uh, however, yes, we can also say, like uh, uh, your discussion, that the state maybe um, have some structural uh, uh, structural deep issues. Uh, uh, but uh, from the Middle East uh, viewpoint, the basic uh, problem is the turmoil, the, the war, uh, the tension. Uh, because if you, if you see the past, we have a lot of, um, a lot of records from the people who are arriving where uh, they had an excellent agriculture, uh, very good fisheries, a very well-organized state that helped a lot. So there are different reasons. However, in all these cases, the environmental stress because of climate change and because of natural disasters is always a multiplier. Yeah. No, but it, it yeah. does point out that it's not a blanket. Everything that's happening in the same place, you know, different. Different mixes. Other comments or questions here to the end of this motion and session? Yeah, sometimes. I heard that uh, the USA military preparing for climate change, but European uh, country military uh, don't uh, prepare uh, about climate change. Uh, could you explain uh, more detail? Yeah. So speak to the difference between the U.S. military and European militaries in terms of prepare, uh, understanding, preparing for, and how they view and act on climate change. Yeah. Um, if you see the, I think, and please correct me, Jeff, uh, if I'm right, I think that uh, the last two, three years, all the different branches of uh, the U.S. military, Army, Navy, and Air Force, have very specific target, uh, very specific targets, and very specific goals, and very uh, specific strategies. How to respond each branch uh, to climate change challenges? It's very different from as a naval officer. I can uh, reassure you that it's very different uh, for a naval officer. The challenges will be very, very different in the sea with the challenges uh, uh, for the army. At the same time the opportunities will be very different uh, because bad weather is not only a challenge for the Navy and for Army and for Air Force, but it's also an opportunity to attack, okay? Uh, it's a challenge for some operations, but it's also an opportunity that can make you to be undercover. So uh, all these different challenges and opportunities have been addressed from the U.S. Army. However, in Europe, uh, because we still do not have we are trying to have a common security strategy, but we have not achieved that yet, okay? Um, we do not have uh, specialized strategies for these, different three, for these three different branches. And we even do not have a common, because we could, uh, we could understand that, okay, we have not moved forward so much, but we may could have a climate security strategy that each country after that to translate it according to the, its needs. We do not even have this climate security strategy. And in order to give you um, uh, uh, the difference in numbers, uh, we had, uh, because I, I also collaborate with European Defense Agency in the working group that is doing and formulates the climate security agenda for European Defense Agency, uh, we had the uh, General uh, Secretary um, from US who is working on environmental security issues. I don't remember exactly the name. Maybe uh, Jeff, you know uh, who is working on that. And he told us that there is three point something billion for the climate uh, as a climate security fund 
for uh, the Greek, uh, for the U.S. Uh, um, military for the following years. Uh, compared with the European uh, preparedness on these issues, that there is, uh, there is uh, openly, there is, n there is no Navy, no Army, no Air Force that has uh, already uh, uh, preparing some funds just for the climate threats that we will have. And to give you a last example, uh, this year there are some, if you Google, uh, you can find some images of Greece where we had uh, three uh, major uh, incidents uh, that a little bit shake uh, uh, the political leaders uh, and they understood that they, we need to take measures. The first one was that, uh, the first one was uh, we had an air base with helicopters, uh, Air Force helicopters, which was totally flooded in Greece. And you will see some uh, pictures there that you can find uh, some helicopters, more than 20 uh, war helicopters that were uh, all flooded. We had uh, a big fire that was expanded from uh, one of the biggest forests of Greece to one of the biggest Air Force bases and we have huge explosions because this fire was expanded there. And the third one, we had um, uh, a fire in one of uh, the Natura uh, forests uh, in uh, North Greece, uh, where we had, uh, there were a lot of refugees and we had more than 20 people who died there and they were refugees who entered Greece. So you can see how some uh, uh, climate disasters we are connected with the preparedness of um, uh, of uh, a European state and uh, I remember that uh, uh, we had a discussion and I asked uh, uh, you may could find back in 2019 I think in the Tyndall Air Base in US uh, there was um, a, a huge disaster where a lot of air uh, uh, aircrafts were destroyed. Um, in Greece, we are planning to buy uh, some M35. We're planning to buy 20 plus 20 in the following next uh, 10 years. And there is a huge debate about the cost of all these aircrafts. And my question to our policymakers and uh, our people was that uh, what will happen in case that we are not prepared and we not, do not plan how to be covered from all these climate disasters. And we have something that is uh, similar to what happened back in 2019 in the United States in this air base. That would be a huge di di disaster for the Greek state because um, uh, to, to spend around 10 billion for a state like Greece, which is a small state, is a huge number okay, for its economy. Uh, and you can understand that in, in this situation, uh, uh, we will have a big impact in our uh, security capability and capacity. So that means that we need to be prepared. And unfortunately, until today, we do not have, as I told you, specialized and make all these climate challenges. We have not translated that to our military, to our Navy and to our Air Force. And of course, uh, all the other European member states. Having the same. Thank you. Well, we're about at the end of the time for the any final words. Obviously, we'll uh, have some of the reports that have been mentioned on the resources that we can. <laughs> oh, so to make sure. Sorry, uh, Demetrius, I'm saying yes. We, we have the opportunity. I'll, I'll be sure to reach out to you to get documents that you'd like to share with them. We're compiling lots of resources. Of course, of course. Yeah, yeah. The virus peace report that mentioned. Yeah. Then, but, yeah, Francisco. Yeah, I don't know the communication. I feel it about some of the issues that are truly, you know, that there, you know, one of the main reasons that they got that problem to deliver instead of the environment that is easy. Uh, yeah, so one of the things for, for follow-up, if there are um, analysis and reports that detail the different um, 
factors that drive people to move, the people coming through the camp, but the larger kind of uh, migration literature that includes climate and the other factors. Um, I'll, I'll be sure to solicit those um, resources from you and we can put them together. Some of the things we were talking about on that other project, right? That yeah. the literature that we can yeah. share for sure. Okay. Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah, we, we were at a phone call last night about a project on those topics. And so we've been talking about exactly who are the who are the people and who are the resources for them. Okay. Well, Demetrius, thank you, sir. And please give greetings to everyone there in Lesmos. And uh, okay. thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks. Uh have a nice evening, uh, night. Uh, yes, oh no, evening uh, there. And uh, I hope to help you for uh, uh, whatever question or a follow up, uh, you can reach me from my email. Thank you very, very much for this invitation. Thank you very much, uh, Jeff. Uh, uh, we stay connected and for whatever else I'm here for you. Okay. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Thanks, Dimitri. Take care. Bye bye. Bye bye. 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 Okay, so we'll uh, come back at 